should send somebody's brother over that will dare to throw out the lot by his peril to share. Throw out the lot by, throw out the lot by, somebody's lovely evening. God, it would be a lovely time for you to come back and get us, God. Uh, God, uh, we look for you. God, we ask that you come back and get us. Help us in this hour. God, uh, many Christians are asleep across this land. I pray you wake them up. God, it's a little late to wake up, but I guess uh, um, sometime is better than never. So help us, God. Uh, help us to look to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've seen the lightning flashing and heard the thunder roll. I felt sin breakers ashing, trying to conquer my soul. I've heard the voice of Jesus. Tell him he's still to fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me alone. The world's first winds are blowing, temptation sharp and keen. I feel a peace in knowing my Savior stands between. He stands to shoot me from danger when earthly friends are gone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. When in a fiction valley, I'm treading the road of care. My 
my Savior has me to carry, my cross went heavy to bear. My feet in tangle with briars, ready to cast me down. My Savior whispered his promise, never to leave me alone. No, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. He died for me on the mountain, for me the empty sun. For me he opened the fountain, the crimson flame empty and empty. For me he fled it in glory, seated upon his throne. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Number uh, Psalm uh, forty-five. Forty-five. I'm going to talk about something. Some of you little children won't know what I'm talking about, but I'm going to try to explain it to you. Maybe you do. Maybe your mama's been good teaching you and has taught you about this. It's called penmanship. Penmanship. That means that when you write, you write pretty letters. Now, unfortunately, as you get older, um, your penmanship kind of goes to the dogs. Yeah, mine kind of went to the dogs like in the eighth grade. But, uh, you know, that's the end <laughs> of uh, Back before the printing press got invented... Uh, everything, books, um, any kind of uh, announcement by the king, 
um, letters from people, diaries, you know, all kinds of things were all handwritten uh, with pens and ink. And uh, for a long, long time, they used uh, goose quills. Uh, they would take feathers off of uh, 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 geese, uh, and then they would... Uh, uh, they were hollow when they let them dry a little bit. Then they would kind of take a knife and they would carve the the um, the kind of a plasticky uh, uh, part that comes out of the feathers, and they would carve that into a sharp little tip. And because it was hollow, they could dip that into an ink well and want to hold some ink. And then you could take that little sharp place that you carved and you could write letters with it on a piece of paper. And some people called scribes were very good at their penmanship and they could write nice letters that everybody could read. Um, when we think of all the things that we deal with, uh, especially in church, um, take, take the songs we just uh, sang. And then uh, there's one uh, that I heard today on the radio. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice and it told thy power divine. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer. Amen. That was written by Fanny Crosby, a blind lady. She couldn't run a typewriter, which was invented toward the end of her life. Uh, she could barely uh, write. And sometimes uh, as she got older and got arthritis, she had to have some other people write her her songs down from. But this book here for centuries and centuries and centuries was written by hand by someone who had penmanship. Look at verse number one. It says, My heart is in tiding a good matter. I speak of things which I have touching the king, made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Heavenly Father, help us. God, um, help us to have good matters in our heart. And God, help us to make things as touching the King. But Lord, most of all, help us to have on our tongue what's written, God, close to hand so we can tell others. And God, help us to treasure this book. Uh, God, as I study... Uh, history and I study uh, the transmission of the scriptures it, it means more to me than ever did that someone took the time and the effort and the hard hard work years and years and years and years and years each one of them to make sure that I have a Bible that I can read in my own language and I can preach to others. And now we're so we're so fortunate we can go down to a, a dollar store we can get one for a dollar. Or we can write off to a company and get one for a, a couple of dollars. And God, uh, uh, that's, that's such a privilege. We don't realize it. Help us never to take it for granted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The book of Job, way back the first book that was ever written in the Bible, Job exclaimed this one time when he was arguing with his friends. He said, oh, that my words were now written. Well, he got his wish. They were written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Well, they were. That they were graven with an iron pen and lead in a rock forever. Now, Job had a, he said, well, if you can't put them in a book, get, get the uh, local piece of granite and get one of those steel pens and grave my words in stone. You go to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, I grew up outside of Washington, D.C., and D.C. is full of statues. And full of things. You go to the Lincoln Memorial. And there's a big old uh, statue of Abraham Lincoln. And, and around the statue is uh, the words that he said from speeches. There's a whole Gettysburg Address on, on one wall. And things that he said about the Union. And things that he said about the American people. And then you go uh, down the ways a little bit. And you go to the Jefferson Memorial. And, and around that round rotunda uh, where his statue uh, is in the middle of uh, are the famous words of Thomas Jefferson, uh, the one of the writers of the Declaration of Independence, a great man, and, and and these are engraved in stone for all time, 
And people go there every day and they look at those things and they, some people have never heard them before, some people know them well. Job said, I want my words to be graven on a stone somewhere. Well, they were. They were put in a book for all time. Uh, they, they didn't have much writing when Job was around. They had this stuff called parchment, which was made out of skins. The Egyptians used a paper called um, papyrus, which was made out of papyrus reeds. Uh, they would take the reeds and they would flatten them out when they were wet. Then they would sit them in the sun when they were and then, until they dried. Then they would weave them together kind of like a basket. Then they would take a great big uh, uh, sponge and they would wet them down and they would roll them, a big stone roller. Then they'd set them back in the sun to dry again. And all that processing, they became kind of one sheet of paper. And they would write on the papyrus. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 1 said the sins of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a point of a diamond. It is graven upon the tables of their heart and upon the horns of your altars. God is keeping track. Now he's not up there with a typewriter. He's really not up there with a diamond tip iron pen. But God said that to get people's attention. He says look. I'm going to take my, your sins and I'm going to make you realize what you've done to me and what, how you've disobeyed me. And it's going to be like I took an iron diamond tip pen and I just grooved them in your heart. You're going to feel real bad. Real bad. Well, those are the kind of penmanship we don't want. We want good penmanship. We want the penmanship found in this, this book here. Uh, first of all, I want you to notice that uh, this Verse in Psalm 45 speaks of the tongue. The tongue. That's the spoken word. The spoken word. Before anything was ever written down in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, all the way to Revelation, the book of Job, the book of Psalms, you name it, it was all spoken by somebody. It was spoken by somebody. And then someone took and wrote it down. Well, the people that speak the word of God now... We call them preachers. Well, they were preachers back in those days. Uh, you go to the book of Ecclesiastes, for instance. And Solomon calls himself a preacher. He said in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 10, he said, The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. You know, that's still true today. Your pastor works awfully hard at his sermons. To find just the right words to say to you. To get across what you need to learn from the scriptures. Acceptable words. And that which was written was upright. Even the words of truth. I want to say the truth. I want to say words that are acceptable to God. Verse 11. The words of the wise are as goads. That's a sharpened stick, youngins. And his nails fastened by the masters of assembly, which are given from one shepherd. Now, when you're driving a bunch of animals, sometimes you have a stubborn animal up front that don't want to go. You know what a, a, a herder of animals has to do sometimes, children? He has to take that pointy stick and he has to stick it. Well, I will tell you where he pokes it. But it hurts. And that animal, guess what they do? They go forward. Sometimes God has to take his word and stick us with a stick. He has to goad us into doing something. Oh, Lord, that hurts. Well, get going. And further by these, my son, be admonished. Of the making of books there is no end, and of much study is a weariness to the flesh, of the flesh. Yeah, amen to that, brother. Amen to that. The spoken word. The words of a preacher. Now, I don't want to uplift my office, but we need preachers now that we've, uh, we've never needed them more than we need preachers right now is what I'm trying to say. Our, our society is falling apart. There are people that are diametrically opposed not only to this book, but to you as a Christian and everything you stood for. Our founding fathers that came over on all those ships, 
They don't believe in those people. They don't believe in what they stood for. They don't believe why they came here. They, ha they, have, uh, they call themselves Americans. They call themselves uh, members of our society. But deep in their heart, they want to tear it all down. And we need preachers to stand up and preach the word. When Europe was in its worst throes of the black death and, and, and the foreign invaders, you know what God did? He raised up preachers to stand and preach. Persecuted as they were, they helped Europe get through the tough times. What do they preach? Well, they preach the words of God. I don't pretend to get up here and preach just what I think. I preach the words of the living God. God has an opinion about the way you live and what you say and what you do and how society runs and how the government should do things and how the church should do things and how you should treat your dog. Say God, God's not that... Well, well, read the Bible from cover to cover. He's got some pretty strong opinions just about everything. And you say, well, he don't mention television. He don't mention this and that and the other. Yeah, but he says some things in this book that apply to those things directly. The most amazing thing to me is all those words were written down by somebody. And they kept getting written down. They kept getting written down. In Jeremiah's day, they, they asked, uh, Jeremiah's secretary was named Baruch. And they asked Baruch, so... The king and his gang came to Baruch and they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words in his mouth? So they're going to try to trip old Baruch up. Then Baruch answered them, He pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in a book. <laughs> I like old Baruch. It's like, okay, you're going to ask a stupid question? I'm going to give you a stupid answer. <laughs> You dummy, what do you think? He spoke and I wrote him down. You know, um, you have to be careful with this book. This book is likened to a hammer. Did you know that? Um, you ever seen a little kid with a hammer that didn't know how to use a hammer? Or maybe someone uh, or like me back 30, 40 years ago that did, didn't use tools very much back in those days. Um... You get an inexperienced person or a person, a kid, and they, you know uh, they'll tap the nail, and then they'll then they'll take that hammer right up next to the head, and they go tap 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 tap, and it'll take them forever if if they ever get the nail in. And you, why? Because you know there there's no power. They're afraid you're going to swing the thing and hit their thumb. But you take an experienced carpenter, and he sets that nail. And he, he gets back on the end of the handle and he goes whap! And if it's a good carpenter, he's got a good hammer, that's usually all that's necessary. Sometimes he'll have to whack it again. But that nail goes right in because he's got the power, he's got the leverage to whack that nail. And if you know what to do with your book, if you've gotten into your book and you know what's in the book and how to handle the book, well, you can take that hammer and you can whack them nails and you can get the job done quickly and cleanly. So, they're writing down. That reminds me of the next point. The scribing of the words. The scribing of the words. See, a pen, like this one, is nothing but an implement for writing, scribing something. Inscribing is what they used to call writing before they called it writing. And it's just taking uh, sounds and drawing uh, characters that represent those sounds. And alphabets are kind of related to one another. You can open a dictionary up and somewhere in that dictionary you'll find a chart of the alphabet. And you'll see that our alphabet, it, it, it started with the Phoenicians. And then it went to the Greeks and the Romans. And, and it, it went down through history till you got to the alphabet that we have. And each one of those little letters on that page has to do with a sound. S is sh, and C is k, and B is b, and D is d. And you, know, and you write all those down. And then you have combinations of letters like TH. And a writer 
You used to have to know all that stuff. Now all you got to do is you, you go and get an education and, and you can pretty well inscribe the letters that you're thinking or the letters that you're saying. And you need a tool for that. Well, the tool is a pen. A pen. In Judges 5, verse 14, it talks about pens. Out of Ephraim there was a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin, among thy people out of my car, came down governors and out of Zebulon, they that handle the pen of the writer. So the tribe of Zebulon had a bunch of people who were good at writing. So whenever you needed something written in old Judea or Israel, you'd send to the tribe of Zebulon, and they'd send you down a good guy who could write things. Um, you ever heard this story about the, the Christmas carol? And they had a guy in Mr. Scrooge's office, and he was uh, Bob Cratchit. He was outside, and his job, Bob Cratchit's job, was to write all the accounts out in books. So someone would pay, uh, you know, three uh, shillings or three pounds to Mr. Scrooge. He had a column in that book of that guy's account, and his job was to write that. They didn't have any computers. He had to write it in a book. And that's what he did all day. He sat there and wrote with a pen and then a little book. And lawyers had those kind of people. Uh, newspapers had those kind of people. Uh, just everybody uh, that time period wrote everything down. And you had to have a pen. Pencils didn't kind of come in until later. Then you had to have something to write them on. Well, the first kind of book they had was rolls. Big, long rolls of things. And, and uh, you know, they're called scrolls. Sort of what sort of sounds like rolls. And you had kind of a stick on this end and a stick on this end. And you just kind of rolled it in. And, and then you might take a, a piece of string and wrap it around. And that was, you just stick it on a shelf somewhere. Well, it wasn't as handy as a book. Later on, they found they could take, take and cut the book into pages and then bind the, the pages together. And it made a much more, you could get a whole lot more pages in a book that way than you could in a scroll. Plus, you didn't have to roll and roll and roll, and it was tough to find your page. I just kept rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. Well, I know the page is around here somewhere. Roll and roll and roll. <laughs> that must have been kind of aggravating if you didn't quite know where the page was. And like I said, they were made out of papyrus, or they were made out of parchment. Paper didn't come till much later. Uh, and the Bible talks about this paper. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 1 says, More of the Lord said to me, Take a great roll and write in it, with a man's pen concerning uh, Malar shall uh, Lamhash Baz, which is the longest word in the Bible. <laughs> Took him a while to write that one out. And he wrote a prophecy according to that uh, thing. God told him to take a roll. And then a little later, uh, in 2 John, uh, he talked about paper and ink. He says, having many things to write unto you, I would uh, not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come to you and speak face to face that your joy may be full. So you see that in John's time, in Jesus' time, they had invented uh, a form of paper. Uh, Paul says, uh, the cloak that I left at uh, Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee the books, but especially the parchments. A lot of expensive books were made out of that leather skin stuff called parchments. And it had an advantage that lasts a good long time. You, you have parchment books that are over 3,000 years old in museums, children. And to think God preserved his word using all those things. All those things. All those things. And then you need ink for writing. Of course, it was paper. Ink for writing. Uh, at first, they, they pressed out berry juice and... Uh, then they found they could grind up uh, bits of coal and charcoal and, and make a black ink. And pretty soon they found they could do different mixtures. And we have the ink that we know today. When I am tired, the Bible is my bed. Or in the dark, the Bible is my light. When I am hungry, it is vital bread. Or fearful, it is an armor for the fight. When I am sick, it is healing medicine, or lonely, thronging friends I find therein. If I would work, the Bible is my tool, or play, it is a harp of happy sound. If I am arrogant, it is my school. If I am sinking, it is solid ground. If I am cold, the Bible is my fire, and it's, it is wings 
if I boldly aspire. Should I be lost, the Bible is my guide, or naked, it is raiment and rich and warm. Am I, am I in prison, it ranges wide, or tossed with a tempest, a shelter from the storm. I would venture, it is a gallant sea, or, or would I rest, it is a flowery lea. Does gloom oppress, the Bible is a sun, or ugliness, it is a garden fair. Am I a thirst, how cool the currents run, or stifled, it is their vivifying air. Since thus thou givest thyself to me, how should I give myself great book to thee? That's a good question, isn't it? All the centuries went into writing this book, preserving this book. And you know who had oversight over it all? God Almighty himself. So how do you know this is the word of God? Well, why would God start something that was perfect and then give me something that was a shoddy piece of gear? Do you ever know God to do that in all of the recorded scriptures? God don't do that. When he gives you something, it's a great thing. Then there's the scribe. You see, you can have the spoken word, and you can have all the tools, the pen and the ink and the papyrus, but you've got to have a scribe to write the words down. Jeremiah 8, 8, how shall I say, are we wise in the law of the Lord with us? Lo, certainly in vain he made it. The pen of the scribe is in vain. That was the people saying, Jeremiah, why are you doing this? All that writing is in vain. All, all, all that penmanship, all that stuff, you know, it's just, no, it wasn't in vain. It wasn't in vain. You say, well, they got carried away to Babylon. Yeah, but they took the book with them and they brought it back with them. And they spread it. And because they brought it to Babylon, it went into the Medes and the Persians. And they spread it. And then it went into the Greeks and they spread it. And then the Romans spread it. Everywhere the scribe went, he spread the word of God. Uh, to be a scribe, you have to be wise in the law. Daniel said this in Daniel 9. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Daniel was a Bible scholar. He was a, a studier of the Bible. He didn't just lay around and pray or, or, or do this or that. He, he not only prayed every day, but he spent a good portion of his time studying the Bible that he had. You say, well, he didn't have the complete Bible. Yeah, but he understood a lot more than some people do nowadays. He was wise in the law. He was not only that, but he was ready to work. Ready to work. Psalm 45 says, talks about the pen of a ready writer. He says, I'm ready to go to work. I'm ready to write it down. I'm ready to, I'm ready to put the word of God out. You know why we ought to put the word of God out? Because it's the words from the king. It's the words from a king. We don't need a king. We have a king. Now, we live in a free country. Aren't you glad? We live in a republic. For right now, we have freedom to preach. We have freedom to assemble. We have freedom to proselyte. But I'm telling you folks that those freedoms are soon coming to an end if we don't pray and we don't stand up and start being Christians and get God's favor on our, on our work. In conclusion, God's keeping records. Did you know that? He said, well, I thought he was finished writing the book. I'm not talking about writing the scriptures. I'm talking about keeping records on you. God keeps records on us. Daniel 7 says, Behold, till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did set, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame. His wheels were burning fire. A fiery stream issued forth from before him. Thousands and thousand thousands ministered unto him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. Revelation 20, 12 says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. According to their works. God's keeping a record even today. I want him to record in that record that 
Brother Jeff tried to preach the word and tried to spread the word. I want him to record in the book about you that you were a good Christian witness and you were a faithful Christian and, and you tried to do right and tell people what was right and stand up for Jesus. Did you know there is one book that is banned from schools in America? There's only one book that's banned. It's the Bible. It's banned in every classroom. It's never to appear on any teacher's desk in a public school or, or ever to be read daily to the students. Only one book is hated and feared by the communists and humanists and other atheistic groups. They claim that it is uh, only a book of myths and legend, yet they cannot tolerate it. Funny they don't feel the same way about uh, Bullfinch's mythology or, or Aesop's fables. A religious liberal years ago was attacking the Bible in his weekly column that the Bible was full of errors and contradictions and superstitions and folklore and mythology. We requested permission from the newspaper to answer him week by week, line by line. In our answer, we asked him why if the Bible was only a man-made book of legend, he could not let it alone. Why the weird bent to discredit a book of legends? When 10,000 Bibles were sent from America to the people of Romania, communist dictator Nicholas Trajescu accepted them in order to get favored nation status from the United States Congress. He then shipped them to a paper mill to be pulped and turned into toilet paper. They were so poorly recycled that the Bible words such as Esau, Jeremiah, and God remained visible. That was in 1990. Good for them. You can't stamp out God's word. The wicked communist leader eventually met a horrible death as his regime was toppled by the people he had persecuted. The anvil of God's word had broken another little human hammer that beat upon it. The enemies of God's word will be judged by the word which they reject, despised, and hate. The redeemed will be saved. The word uh, will have let them be accepted and loved by Jesus Christ because they believe what it said. You say, what if worse comes to worse? Well, it may. But you've got to remember, just because a human force comes and wipes God's things away on this earth, that doesn't mean it's totally true. One day the wheel's going to turn. And they're going to be standing before God, and He's going to have the advantage over them. And they'll be sorry on that day. They'll be sorry. So, so what about our penmanship? We see, we take this book, we read it, we believe it, and then with our right, our life is like a pen, and we write those words out for the public to see. And I ask you tonight, how's your penmanship, Christian? Is it legible? Is it nice handwriting someone would like to read? Or is it such a scribbly mess they can't tell what it says? Let's have good penmanship, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you. Lord, for your book. And Lord, thank you that our tongue can be the pen of a ready writer. And God, we have the words of the king. And God, help us to have courage and down in our heart. God, some of the things that's going on today in this country, let alone around the world, are frightening. But God, I don't fear because i got you on my side. And God, they may take and haul me away tomorrow, stick me in jail, or I don't know, stick me in some uh, line and fire a gun at me, or, or uh, hang me by a tree, or, or burn me in an oven, or gas me in a chamber, I don't know. They may do all kinds of horrible things to people. They have in the past. But God, that never stopped you. And it won't, God. Because you're God, and they're not. So Lord, let us have courage. And let us stand for you, God. Make every one of us good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Bless us now as we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.